Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I want to talk to you about Thales of Miletus. Uh, he is regarded as the first scientist, the first philosopher, uh, also as the first mathematician, which makes him the perfect subject for my first video. All of these attributions come second or third hand. Thales of Miletus didn't actually write anything, or if he did, we don't have it today. The sources that we do have uh, come from people like Herodotus, who wrote the first history, and also of Aristotle, who quoted a lot of philosophers who came before him. Um, the credit of Thales being the first mathematician actually comes from a guy who was born a millennium later, and it's Proclus, and that appeared in his Commentaries of the Elements. Uh, so we don't know if Thales is actually the first of any of these things. However, tradition holds that he was the guy, and so uh, that's what we say. So even the date of Thales' birth is actually unknown. We can narrow it down a little bit through looking at the things he's credited for. Uh, for instance, uh, the eclipse of 585 BC uh, was said to be had been was said to have been predicted by Thales. So, for instance. Uh, Thales apparently had described a day that would suddenly be turned into night, and during the sixth year of a war between the Lydians and the, and the Medes. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but hey. Um, so, uh, when the event actually happened, uh, it caused such an anxiety in the Lydians and the Medes that they quickly went into peace negotiations. I think a marriage happened or something, and, and people settled it. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, the data that Thales had at the time would not have been good enough to make a, an accurate prediction of the year of the solar eclipse. And it wasn't down to the day, by the way. It was down to the year of uh, 585 that Thales was, is said to have made the prediction. But the only people who were collecting enough data to make a prediction like this would have been the Babylonians. Um, now, for lunar eclipses, it would have been fine because lunar eclipses happen at the same time all around the planet. But solar eclipses happen at different times at different locations. Uh, which means that if he used any of the data that the Babylonians had, it would not have been sufficient in order to make this prediction uh, where he was. So two, one of two things are possible. One, he might have gotten lucky. And two, uh, he could have just been the local wise man. And when something weird happens, they just said he predicted it. Uh, so, he gets a credit one way or the other. Now, today we know actually that the eclipse happened in 585 because we can do backward calculations. It wasn't recorded in Herodotus' Herodotus's histories. And if we make the assumption that, the, that Thales predicted the eclipse in his prime, you put him at prime as being, say, 40, then that gives you a date of around 620 of when he was born. Uh, there's another event that happened uh, later that helps narrow it down even better. Um, so, for instance, um, we know that uh, it is reported uh, through other sources that uh, Thales died during the 58th Olympiad, and, um, and they say that he actually died at 78. So, um, that narrows it down even more because the 58th Olympiad is thought to have happened at 546 BC, and so then that gets you a date of 624 BC as Thales' birth. So, so we think he lived from 624 BC roughly and died around uh, 546 BC, and that's about the best we can say. Um, so another neat thing that, while we're talking about Herodotus's mentions of Thales is that I, um, Croesus. I, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right, and probably not, uh, but Croesus was trying to cross the Halys River to attack the Persians, and, um, and Thales was apparently in the encampment at the time. And the, the Halys River was just way too big for Croesus to ford with his armies. Um, so I, Herodotus actually thinks that this might not have been the case. He thinks that bridges existed back then, but, um, but the Greek tradition holds that Thales told them to dig another channel and split the river in two. And then once split, uh, the armies were able to cross each of the rivers without any incident. 
So, uh, so I thought that was a pretty cool uh, story. Um, so yeah, so Thales is often regarded as the first scientist, and this comes from uh, Aristotle. Now, it, he appears in several places in Aristotle's work. Um, he appears in his physics, uh, sorry, his metaphysics, as well as in um, his On the Soul uh, book. So one big thing that Th Aristotle goes on talking about is that um, Thales um, was the first one to look for original causes. And, and Aristotle says this is really important if you're looking, if you're trying to do any science, is that you need to come up with a reason for uh, for like several first causes. This according to Aristotle, that uh, you need to figure out what things are made of, roughly. You need to, and another thing you need to figure out is uh, how they move around, uh, or, or rather what causes change. And so in two different places he, he cites this. He hasn't actually put um, what Thale, the things that Thales said about what causes change until another book, not in his metaphysics, where he talks about science. Uh, but where it does talk about science, Aristotle credits Thales as being the first one to come up with some sort of basic constituent of nature. And, and Thales himself says that everything is made of water. And so uh, Aristotle goes on, and it sounds kind of peculiar uh, to us. Um, so it's important to say that Aristotle didn't actually know the reasoning for why Thales thought everything was made of water. And this is another reason to think that Thales might not have actually written anything down. This might have all been passed down by word of mouth. Uh, because Aristotle only speculates on why Thales actually thought everything was made of water. Um, so uh, one reason why Aristotle claims that Thales thought this is that everything seems to subsist by water. So every animal, plant, and things like that, or at least that's my interpretation of what Aristotle said. And another thing is that um, Aristotle said that uh, even fire is, mo is moist and so, and is fed by moist things. Um, I, I don't know why you would think that fire is moist, but maybe this is just a general thought of the Greeks at the time. So anyway, so uh, for these reasons, everything, all these things that require water uh, is what makes Aristotle think that Thales claims that everything is made of water, or everything comes from water. There's a funny quote that comes from Bertrand Russell's A History of Western Philosophy, and uh, it comes at the introduction of the uh, Milesian school, um, which included Thales, and it started with Thales. Um, and it goes like this. In every history of philosophy for students, the first thing mentioned is that philosophy began with Thales who said that everything is made of water. This is discouraging to the beginner, who is struggling, perhaps not very hard, to feel that respect for philosophy which the curriculum seems to expect." Uh, so it's, it's a funny thought for us today to think that everything is made of water. It's important to keep in mind that the statement, everything is made of water, actually serves as the first hypothesis ever posed. And this is what uh, distinguishes Thales as the first scientist. So once you make the declaration or make the hypothesis that everything is made of water, then you can go forward and you can test it. And these tests actually continued until the 18th century. It wasn't until Lavoisier, uh, again, I, I'm not sure if I pronounce these things right, but it wasn't until Lavoisier came along with his own experiments to actually demonstrate that you can't get minerals from uh, that dirt isn't made from water. And so, um, so there were still a whole bunch of people holding out on the idea uh, that everything is made of water until relatively recently. So, uh, so maybe it's not quite as crazy as what we think, uh, but you know, in 20th century mindset, everything is made of water is kind of weird, and uh, now 21st century. As far as what causes change, uh, the only thing that uh, we have by Thales on this topic it comes from Aristotle and is on in from his book on, from his work I don't know if you call them books really uh, on the soul hi uh, and basically Thales declared that all things are full of gods and he generally believed that things were also full of souls so um, so he believed everything was full of souls or gods or or what have you and um, and one of the piece of 
pieces of evidence that he uses is that magnets move iron. And so if magnets can move things, then they must have a soul, and therefore um, that supports his hypothesis that things are full of souls. Um, again, a bit different than the way we think about science nowadays, um, but it is another uh, hypothesis that he is putting forward in order to uh, um, in, tor in order to move ideas along. So the idea that Thales was the first mathematician doesn't actually appear from any of his original works because we don't have any of it. It also doesn't come from any of the Greeks at the time. The first mention of Thales in connection with Thales' theorem, for instance, or any of his other mathematical work, uh, appears in a commentary of Euclid's Elements, which is, if you don't know, Euclid's Elements is basically a summary of all the geometry known at the time, and I think all of mathematics known at the time. Um, and so it includes some number theory, but mostly it's geometry. And there's several theorems in there that have been attributed to Thales, and those attributions come from Proclus, who was born, uh, let me get this right, um, in 412 AD. And that's more than a millennium after uh, Thales' birth. And no matter what date you choose for Thales' birth, it's pretty late. So this happened, So it's a millennium later that we actually start seeing these attributions. And now, we've lost a lot of material uh, from that time period. And so there might have been other things that made the attribution that would lead Proclus to making this mention. But as it is, um, that is the only statement that we have that connects Thales to his mathematical work. But at the same time, uh, if we're going to put it on anybody, it seems like a, a good person to put it on. So Thales' theorem says that if you take a circle and you inscribe a triangle inside the circle, that means that each of the points of the triangle uh, lies on the circle itself. And you also happen to have one of the sides of the triangle being the diameter, then that means that the angle opposite the diameter is going to be 90 degrees. Now this is a, uh, is a fairly straightforward statement to prove, uh, but what makes it significant is that Thales proved it using other facts that he already established. And now, by doing this construction, he made the first deductive proof, and that's what credits him as being the first mathematician. He actually got a lot of his geometry from the Egyptians and through his travels because he, because Miletus actually isn't all that far from Egypt. So we know that the Egyptians, for instance, knew about triangles and, um, and geometry in general. Uh, the Babylonians knew about quadratic equations. Um, but most of that work was intuitive. It wasn't deductive, where you start with a bunch of facts and you build up new facts. And that is why we call Thales the first mathematician, because mathematicians today uh, don't declare something true unless you actually can prove it based on other things that you've already established being true. The story goes that once Thales proved Thales' theorem, that he sacrificed an ox to the gods. Now, we don't actually know if this is true either, uh, since everything we have from him is secondhand, it could be apocryphal. But if he did actually uh, sacrifice an ox to the gods, he probably sacrificed it to Apollo, uh, who had a big temple over in Didyma, which is nearby. So Apollo becomes sort of the neighborhood gods. But again, we don't know if this was actually the case. But whether he sacrificed an ox or whether or not he proved uh, the serum, he, He's the first person to have any mathematical facts attributed to him. So we call him the first mathematician. And now why don't we look at what Thales' theorem is, and I want to also talk about one interesting modern application of Thales' theorem. Thank you for stopping by. If you like this video, please press the like button, and consider subscribing to my channel for more of the same. Up at the top right here, you can see a companion video where I describe the proof of Thales' theorem and a, a modern application. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook uh, through facebook.com slash thatmaththing. Please consider supporting this page through Patreon. You can find the link here and in the description down below.